We are going to call the meeting to order. Wednesday, the 5th of October, 2005, right at 7.07 p.m. The invocation this evening was provided by the Reverend William Clinton Stockton of the First Pres Presbyterian Church, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance by Councilman Norman Hodge. Would you all please stand? Let us pray. Most holy God, as we come into your presence, we come with an understanding that as we contemplate your holiness, we realize that we are not a holy people. We stumble, we fall, we fail. And it's with that in mind, we're grateful that you've established officials to oversee this city to protect us in our decisions and in our walk and and all that we do that affects not only ourselves and our families, but the lives of those about us. We're grateful that you gave us great officials in this city. We're also grateful for all the public servants that work for this city, all the civil service workers, right down to the custodians who keep this city hall so clean. Father, you've been good to this city, and for that we, we give you praise. Father, we ask that as this meeting progresses, that uh, you visit us with your presence, that you bring peace, not a peace that the world understands, but a peace that you can bring. May everything that's said and done be done in an orderly, a clear, a concise, and an honest manner. Father, watch over uh, all the proceedings. Protect these fine citizens of the city and protect these officials that you established. Father, again, we want to thank you for your steadfast love and for caring for us. Uh, when we consider who you are and what we are, it amazes us because of your steadfast love for us, your concern for us, your hand constantly overshadowing us as a community. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your presence tonight. For this we ask in your holy name. Amen. 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 Please join me as I... The flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Mayor Warren. Present. Mayor Bell. Here. Councilwoman Garner? Here. Councilman Hodge? Here. Councilman Lozner? Here. Councilman Porter? Here. Councilwoman Waldman? Here. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Pastor Stockton and Councilman Hodge. Thank you very much, Pastor. Any additions, deletions, or deferrals? None, Mayor. 5A, we are honored to have this evening our friend. Congressman Mario Diaz Villard, and he's going to present a check. Come forward, Congressman. Come on with that. I don't know what the check is. <laughs> 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 Talk when you lose that much money, Mr. Mayor. Uh, before we do this, um, uh, Mr. Mayor and uh, honorable members of this uh, distinguished commission, this council, city manager, the uh, city attorney. Uh, we had a wonderful year. Uh, this looks like it's becoming a habit, coming here to Homestead City Hall to present money, to present hard-earned, the taxpayers' hard-earned money for worthwhile projects here in the city of Homestead. And I've gotten a lot of credit for it, and I appreciate that. But, but I think uh, it's important that I say really how this works and how this happens. None of this would be possible without the leadership of the men and women that are here today. Uh, they are meeting with myself, with my staff, on a constant basis. I've had the opportunity to have lunches and dinners with the mayor, with the manager, with the vice mayor, with members of this council in Washington, as well as here. We have a number of working meetings, and throughout those meetings what happens is that we, we, we sit down and we hash it out and we, we figure out what makes sense, what's doable, what isn't doable, uh, what are the things that we think we can get uh, that year looking at how the federal picture looks. 
because of this teamwork that we have developed and this trust that we have developed. And I do trust these men and women. Um, we've been able to do very well together. And this year is no exception. This year may be a little bit bigger. Uh, obviously, we were able to tweak the funding formula in the transportation bill from Washington. That's something that I'm really excited about. So the entire state of Florida is going to do much better than it has in the past for the next few years. And that's important. I don't know if you're aware that for every dollar that we sent up to D.C., we've only been getting, before we only used to get 80 plus cents for every dollar. For the last few years, we've been getting 90.5. And now in this bill that we just passed, we're going to be now getting 92 cents for every dollar. Now that's not where we want to be, but think about what that little tweak means as far as money for road projects here in our state. And it's billions, over $8 billion dollars for the state of Florida. But I want to mention, and of course Homestead will get its fair share of that. But on top of that, because of this relationship, this relationship of trust and of, and of hard work that we've developed, Homestead is getting, on top of that, the largest road project in, this, in the entire county is actually coming here. And that's not by chance. That's because these men and women work with my office. We then work together with the people, the folks up in D.C., and we've had a wonderful year. And that's why we are here. I'm here to thank you, uh, the members of this council, the, the, the manager, the city attorney, the mayor, uh, for your hard efforts, for your hard work, uh, for your uh, willingness to go above and beyond what I guess you're supposed to be doing by going to D.C. and spending time with me. But it's paid off. I want to thank you for that. I want to thank all of you uh, for uh, your support. And because of that, we've had another good year. So why don't we go ahead and present the check, which is really what we're here to do. Thank you very much. This is for Lucy Street and Mallory Street. Um, and uh, both of them are, are obviously way overdue. And tonight, uh, I'm here to present to the city of Homestead a check for $7,600,000. Thank you all. It is a... Uh, it is... <laughs> It is indeed, it is indeed my honor and my privilege to represent the wonderful city of Homestead in the United States Congress. It is an honor, it is a privilege, and it's good when things work out. Thank you very much. We're going to get a picture. Let me make a few remarks. Thank you, Congressman Mario diaz Ballard. As I said earlier, he is indeed a friend to the people of the city of Homestead. Months ago, when we went up to Washington, Congressman Mario diaz Ballard took us around, talked to the elected officials, and it made a tremendous difference. He's well known in Washington, D.C. and well respected. And it brings to mind my definition of leadership, because that's what it's all about. He is a tremendous leader for his district. And let's define leadership for the congressman. Leadership is the capacity to influence others through inspiration, motivated by passion, generated by vision, produced by a conviction, and ignited by purpose. That equates what Congressman diaz Bellard had done for Homestead. He had a vision, and he had a purpose, and he was passionate about it. And when he talked to his colleagues in Washington, he made things happen for the people of Homestead. So Congressman diaz Bellard, we are so grateful to you. You know, you've given us all of the credit. But we are so grateful for the hard work that you do for us each and every day. 
And when folks in Washington hear the name the City Homestead, they listen because of your efforts. So thank you so very much. The people are so grateful thank you. for your leadership. Thank you. And to further express our appreciation, I'd like to present this token from the Mayor and Council and the people of the City of Homestead with sincere appreciation to Congressman Mario diaz Ballard for your dedication and commitment of time, support, and inspiration to our city. The Mayor and City Council, City of Homestead, for presented October the 5th, 2005. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, because Rosa Hernandez is here with me. She's uh, uh, with my office. And some of you know, because some of you have seen her, she is here once a month, here in City Hall. Um, and uh, she comes down here to make sure that any constituents that can't make it to our office, our office is off of Bird Road and 128th Avenue, um, have an opportunity to have uh, their concerns uh, dealt with on the federal level. That wouldn't be possible, again, without the generosity of the mayor, the commission, the manager, and all of all of you. So on, on the behalf of the constituents that we see here in the city of Homestead who don't have to drive uh, farther north to take the turnpike, uh, we thank you once again to all of you. It is again a privilege. Thank you very much. And again, I apologize for taking so much time, Mr. Mayor. Well, Congressman, one other thing I'd like to say, you know, right after Hurricane Andrew, we received $10 million to help rebuild Homestead, but it's a $10 million loan. This is the largest grant the city have ever received in its history, $7.6 million from Washington. So again, thank, thank you. you so very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Five years the presentation from the T off the tops to Little Angels Foundation, Councilman Councilwoman Wellman. Can I ask all the uh, Little Angel board that's here tonight to come forward? Mayor Council, uh, privileged to be here again to uh, donate a check for uh, the Little Angels. I mean, it's kind of tough coming up after seven million. I guess <laughs> I guess we need to put another zero on this and just don't cash it. <laughs> but uh, and Mario, you can leave your email. We we always need money. What is this? It's a city employees uh, tournament, golf tournament. Uh, basically. The city has no financial burden. Only thing uh, we ask uh, the city manager to do is uh, let us have a 45-minute uh, hour meeting a month, and that's the only responsibility from the city. And we thank them for that. Um, the members are Ron O'Connor, Kim Berger, Marty, uh, Pat Brazillo and uh, Robert Landon, and Dennis Maytan, and myself. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to uh, 
give this check to 13,000, 130,000, excuse me. <laughs> uh, it's, this, is, this was our fourth year. It gets easier every year, I keep telling myself. Um, but the Little Angels really came out and did a fantastic job this year. The volunteers uh, made it go a lot smoother than it really uh, actually needed to go. And we thank you for that very much. And uh, here's 130, I mean 13,000. <laughs> thank you. Wow. 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 <laughs> this is the largest donation that the Little Angels has ever received. And I mean, I thought maybe $1,300, maybe $1,000, but $13,000 from our city employees. And I thank you from the bottom of my very heart. I'm so happy to have a crowd here tonight because usually we don't have this many people, but I'll just take a second to say that my husband and I started this foundation five years ago when our grandson uh, was diagnosed with autism. And it's a foundation that takes care of mentally and physically challenged children in the South Bay area. And um, we've even expanded that a little bit in the last uh, month because we sent $5,000 to the children of Katrina. So this $13,000 will buy wheelchairs, this $13,000 will buy activity chairs, this $13,000 will build playgrounds. It will go so far and it touches my heart so much, guys, that they chose this charity as their charity and we had a blast working it we when you give us any money ever again we're still working it every year <laughs> we had such a really good time um and I, I i'm always the one that speaks but i'd like my husband to say a word tonight he, he didn't know that <laughs> thank you very much <laughs> pull the string <laughs> This, this is really great. Uh, the guys uh, work real hard on this event. Everybody should play in it. It's it's great, and it, we're just very lucky that they've uh, picked us to give us this uh, large amount of money. We'll make really good use of the amount of money they gave us in the community. Well, really well. Thank you. I'd also like to take this opportunity to ask all of you if you know of any child that needs anything that's mentally or physically challenged, please let me know. I'd like to introduce um, some of our angel board. We have Bob Farns, we have Diana Wilson, we have Linda Fagan, Linda Lou, she's getting an award tonight too. <laughs> but please let us know. We depend on the citizens of Homestead to tell us where there's a need. And so often people don't know about us or they're embarrassed to ask, but believe me, we really want to help. And with that being said, I'm taking you all to lunch next week. <laughs> Thank you so much for everything. It was a pleasure. Judy, I do want to say one thing. We also do want to thank everybody that did participate, all the businesses that opened up your wallet and actually did donate and, and played in the tournament as well. So we, we truly appreciate that, and uh, we look forward to you coming next year. Thank you. Okay. Okay. All I want to say is it's enjoyable for all of us in the city to participate in this, to be able to do this, to contribute something back. And I haven't told David yet, but the date for next year is April 29th. Mark it on your calendars. Thank you. I forgot to mention our, our backbone of the tournament, which is Kurt Herring. He's the bashful one, will not come up there and stand with us for reasons unknown. But anyway, uh, I just wanted to clear that up. Kurt is a very big part of the tournament. He's been with us from the initiation. And just to allude, uh, I forget so many things, I get so nervous up here, uh, about the people that contribute to the tournament. We have a lot of support from Homestead. And, you know, it's uh, people that we grew up with. Uh, you know, we all work here, live here, love to work here. And it's all. this is all about Homestead. And uh, 
in, we would just ask uh, all our contributors for their continuous support. Thank you. Thank you. The next item is the employer of the quarter, the second quarter of 2005, Linda Fagan, Country Medical Center, Councilman Hodge. Come. <laughs> Come. And Christine, yeah, and Jessica, yes. It gives me great honor to give this award. We started this just about a year ago. Um, you know, often jobs have an employer of the, of the quarter, employer of the month, where they recognize an outstanding employer. Jesse? <laughs> Let's go. <clears throat> All right. I'll pay her back later. But, um, and we, we started this um, to award and to recognize our local businesses within the city of Homestead. And oftentimes, uh, Homestead and their, and their local businesses go unnoticed. And we have quite a, oft, quite a lot of uh, local businesses here that's doing a great job and nobody never knows about it. It's one of the best kept secrets. So this was one of my ideas to be able to uh, expand this secret by uh, recognizing our businesses in the community and how they are chosen. Um, we have the employ your employees to write letters in to us and then we give that to our Chamber of Commerce B Business and Industry um, Committee and they review those letters and then at that point they vote on which one they think uh, should be the one and whoever gets the most votes uh, comes out. Uh, for the second quarter of this year uh, Dr. Linda, F Linda Fagan uh, was the winner. And normally I don't speak a whole lot unless I'm giving a sermon, and I promise I won't do that tonight. <laughs> but um, I, I do want to say a little something uh, extra special about uh, Dr. Fagan. Um, she's a little bit more than, than just a doctor in our community. Uh, I can call her a, a friend, and we have went as far as being able to call each other family. Uh, although our complexions are much different, but uh, we, we feel that much about one another. Uh, because, um, and I'll just share with you a, a story about it. a little more than a year ago. My grandmother was really sick and, and she had got uh, a sore on her foot and I taken her to a Homestead Hospital. And there she had a cardiac arrest and, and she was put on the machine, um, actually uh, two machines to keep her going for a couple of days and they let her off and then they let her out. And while she was at home, the home visit nurse came by and they said, you really need to take her back to her primary doctor. Well, this in the middle of this time, Dr. Wong, which her primary doctor had decided to move and her uh, insurance company had just given her a doctor that was like in Northwest Miami. So I, I called around for somebody here in Homestead that I could take her to and, and they gave me a name and it was, I'm not going to give a name of the doctor because the service was that bad. And we went there about 9 o'clock that morning and um, we went in as, a, as an emergency visit and, and we sat there pretty much till lunchtime and people were coming and people were going and I, I was kind of frustrated. My grandmother was, was sitting there, really, of course, you know, tired. She was already sickly. And, you know, I, I didn't know where to turn. And I remembered uh, that I had, I had Jesse's phone number and I, I called Jesse and, and asked her for a recommendation. So, of, you know, so immediately she put her, her mother on the phone. 
And when her mother got on the phone, she said, Norman, bring your grandmother here. And I was like, well, let me tell you the insurance she got. You know, I don't know if you take her. She said, don't matter. Bring your grandmother here. And I said, well, you know, I, I, I want to make sure that, you know, you get, you know, covered for everything. She said, that doesn't matter. She said, your grandmother's been sitting up in a doctor's office since 9 o'clock this morning, and here it is, lunchtime. You need to get over here because she needs to be seen about. So I picked my grandmother up and, and put her in the car, drove her over, and within minutes, you know, we went in, went in the door. She gave us a room, and, you know, she, she looked at her, and, and she had a foot specialist that was there. And the foot specialist looked at her doctor, and, and they recommended us to go to a Baptist. And we went up to Baptist and recommended a doctor and everything for us to have to look at my grandmother. And unfortunately, my grandmother never did make it out of the hospital from, from that point. But I remember that moment just like it was yesterday. And because of Dr. Fagan, she was able to get the best care possible in her last days here, here with us. And had, had not, she didn't take that time to, to take a look at her and have someone to take a look at her. Um, you know, I, I don't know what may have would have happened or what could have occurred, but because of Dr. Fagan taking that extra mile, uh, my grandmother was able to be able to lie in the comfort of, of, of good care and have someone that, that knows what's going on to see about her until she was able to pass on. And I never, I never really thanked her for that. Um, and, and this is my opportunity to do so publicly, uh, just something that I kept on the inside. Um, but at this time, I, I really want to thank her. And, and her employees, you know, wrote the letter, but I'm giving the story because this, <laughs> because this is something that's very personal to me. You know, again, she's a friend. I, I can call her family. Um, I, I would trust her with my life uh, because of what, she, of what she's done to me. And she really shows that she's cared, that she cares about her the people of Homestead and, and her profession. And we need those type of doctors in our community. And I just wanted to share that with you. And again, Dr. Fagan, I, I wanted to thank you for everything that you've done. And enough about me. We're going to ask uh, Christine to come and read the letter. Good evening. The staff at Country Medical Center would like to nominate Dr. Linda R. Fagan for the second quarter 2005 Employer of the Quarter. We cannot decide which one of us would nominate Dr. Fagan, so we would like to share the recommendation. Linda R. Fagan has been a nurse practitioner and psychologist in the Homestead area for over 25 years. Her dedication to her patients extends far beyond the walls of her practice. She takes an interest in the lives of both her patients and her staff, both in and out of Country Medical Center. Walking into her practice, you feel a sense of home. She provides guests with an opportunity to share both pictures and fond memories <clears throat> excuse me, of her staff, both past and present, as well as, as of patients. Dr. Fagan's drive to give back to her community is tireless. She offers her practice as a training facility for Job Corps students, nurse practitioner students, and medical coding and billing students from various colleges. Volunteer work is also a very important aspect of Dr. Fagan's life. Thanksgiving is a time when Dr. Fagan asks others in her community to donate goods so she and her staff can make dinner baskets for the less fortunate. During Christmas, Dr. Fagan takes part in Little Angels in order to make this holiday special for children who would otherwise not have a tree or gifts. She recently worked on a project where she collected dresses, tuxedos, shirts, bow ties, shoes, etc. to donate to teenagers who could not afford these items so they may attend their senior prom. Dr. Fagan is on the board and a member with many committees such as Seminole Theater, Ms. Homestead, Chamber of Commerce, Main Street, etc. We as her staff look up and admire what Dr. Fagan has accomplished in her career and how she tirelessly gives back to her community in order to make it better. She is well known in Homestead and puts, and puts that to use by asking other fellow business owners to join her in making these projects and, do, and donations a success. Her patients appreciate her interest in them by participating in some of these projects as well as being there for her in her time of need. In closing, Dr. Fagan's dedication and passion for her community allows her to get to know her patients on a personal level. Her patients are not just another appointment, but a part of her community, and without them, she says, she would not be a success. 
Please consider Linda R. Fagan as second quarter 2005 employer of the quarter. This is just a small way that we as her staff and her community can say thank you for all you've done for us. Sincerely, Christine Clark, Glenda Talley, Jessica Arasola, and Israel Vasquez. Mr. Hodge, may I, just say, may I just add one thing to this? When I had my first breast cancer surgery, Linda scrubbed in, she came in the operating room, and she sat in there for nine and a half hours watching over me, rubbing my head. Now that's dedication, folks. That's a friend. And she deserves, she, you deserve it for the entire century. <laughs> I think we should have a new one. Congratulations, Linda. I love you. <coughs> I'm at a loss for words. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. I have been blessed. I have been totally blessed by having a wonderful family and patients, friends, and a community that I really and truly believe in. After Hurricane Andrew, I decided that I was going to dig my heels in and become so much more a part of this community. It, it is an area that I love and everything that I do every day is for the support and the love of the people in this community. I appreciate everything that's ever been done by the mayor and the council people. Uh, and also helping me build my dream of my own place on 4th Street. And I can't begin to tell you how proud I am today and humbled by this because I do it with a great deal of love and don't expect any kind of admiration at all. But I can tell you that I will continue with my last breath to support and love and, and take care of everyone that's here no matter who you are, no matter what race you are, or any kind of background you are, I will be only too happy to give you a shot. <laughs> <laughs> I do not discriminate. <laughs> thank you very much, and thank you for letting me live in your community. I can definitely tell you she will give you a shot. I, I had a little voice problem the other day and, and uh, I saw her a few days later and she said, come out of my office, I got a shot for you. I said, I don't have the time. <laughs> so she definitely will give you a shot. Um, with that said, I want to present this plaque to Dr. Fagan and it reads, the City of Homestead proudly recognizes Dr. Linda Fagan and Country Medical Center as Employee of the Quarter April through June 2005 in recognition of your commitment to your employees and contributions to the Homestead community August 2005, Marion Castle, City of Homestead. And also we have uh, two other gifts, one for, well, you guys got to split this one, you know that, right? <laughs> so maybe I should just give both of them to her, so I can do that with these guys. Here, huh? <laughs> All right, well, we have, we have a small gift um, from the Capri, and also Ruby Tuesdays for the, each of you, and, and we want to thank you uh, for your participation and helping us grow our community and making it a better place. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Hodge. <clears throat> Item 5D is the presentation of a proclamation for Homestead Energy Services Week. Councilman Lozner. Thank you, Mayor. It seems like we, <clears throat> we just did this, and it kind of shows how time marches on. 
um, of a proclamation tonight in recognition of National Public Works Week. And as we stop and contemplate the weather events of the last month or six weeks, we should again stop and reflect upon how fortunate we are in, in this community to have dedicated, loyal, and experienced employees from right here in this community. In addition to the police force that was out there and, and, and leaving their family in their homes, that our, our utilities people, our, our water treatment people, and after the fact, all our solid waste and everybody who has anything to do with public works, we're here getting our community and the everyday services of our community back on track and back online just as quickly as possible. And uh, we're all very fortunate and we should all be very thankful that we have the men and women uh, from within the public works uh, areas of, of, of our fine city to, to be there for us, uh, many times to the detriments of, of the protection of their families and homes and them, themselves. So as public works and services provided in our community are an integral part of our citizens' everyday lives, and whereas the support of an understanding and informed citizenry is vital to the efficient operation of public work systems and programs such as water, sewer, streets and highways, public buildings, solid waste, parks and canal maintenance, and whereas the health, safety and comfort of this community greatly depends upon these facilities and services. Whereas the quality and effectiveness of these facilities as well as their planning, design con and construction is vitally dependent upon the efforts and skill of public works officials. And whereas the efficiency of the qualified and dedicated personnel who staff public works is materially influenced by the people's attitude and understanding of the importance of the work they perform. And uh, again, at no time except over the past two months, we're, we're again reminded how very important that is for our community. Whereas this year's theme, Public Works, is everywhere you look, is a tribute to the positive improvements that Public Works employees have made to our communities. Now, therefore, the Mayor and City Council of the City of Homestead, Florida, do hereby proclaim the week of October 2nd through 8, 2005, as National Public Works Week in Homestead, and call upon all citizens and civic organizations to acquaint themselves with the issues involved in providing our public works and to recognize the contributions which public works officials make every day to our health, safety, comfort, and quality of life. And I'd like, I see all the red shirts here, and anyone else who's not in their red shirt and is part of our public works family, to please stand so that we can recognize you. Ken, on behalf of the Mayor and Council. Thank you so much. I would just like to thank all the employees from Homestead Energy Services. It's yeah. been a busy year with all of the new construction, um, the brush with two hurricanes, but everybody's risen up to the occasion from customer service who has to write the new accounts, the administration staff, the engineering staff who does all of our design. Um, the power plant personnel and the T&D people that are out there during the storms and also putting in all the new infrastructure, um, it makes my job a lot easier, and I appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Ken, before you leave, I want to say it was such a pleasure after all these years in the past of hearing, oh, sell to FPNL, sell to FPNL. All the people were so grateful that they were City of Homestead customers when they had their power turned on very quickly, like on Friday and Saturday, while the FPNL customers waited till Tuesday. So it was very nice just to smile and say, isn't it good thing? Isn't it good to be at City of Homes, a part of City of Homestead Power? So a very, Thank very you. good job. And that made us pretty proud too. Yes, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Next on the agenda, agenda is the consent agenda. Is there a motion for approval? I'll move it, Mayor. Moved by the Vice Mayor, second by Councilman Lawson. Mayor, no, Mayor I wanted to remove the, uh, for discussion, the management contracts. Move 60 by Mr. Lawson. All uh, Each one. I'll just address them together. 
The two management contracts, the city manager and the police chief. C1. 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 1 and 2. 1 and 2. So we're approving uh, little uh, 2i and 3i. That's the investment advisory and the auditing service. Yes. Okay. Let, let, me you, you, let me highlight how this all started, and then everybody else can chime in. But I think one of the greatest asset in any community is that of a dedicated and committed employee. And I asked the manager weeks ago to consider a contract in his remaining three years and the chief remaining four years to put together a contract for our consideration. And as I look out in the audience and see so many of our city employees, employees policemen, um, utilities, solid waste, public works, you name it, and as I reflect on my years of service, my 24 years of service, I see some of the same faces. And it makes me feel so good that so many of you stayed the course. In the good times and in the bad times, you believed in Homestead, you believed in this city, and you committed your life to making a difference. Chief Rowe and City Manager Ivy, in my eyes, have done the exact same thing. They believe in this community, they made a commitment, and they made a difference, just like many of you. Many of you could have left right after Hurricane Andrew, but you said, no, I see a bright future for Homestead, and I'm going to make a difference. And I'm going to pitch in, and I'm going to help, and I'm going to turn my city around. And we are poised today to be a premier city in the state of Florida in which to live, work, and raise a family. And that's our vision for Homestead. So I asked the council at the committee to hold a week ago to support a contract for Chief Rowe and Curtis Ivey, not only because of what they have done for Homestead, but would send a signal to all of you that when you work hard and you do a good job, this elected body will say thank you in a very special way. And I think these contracts is indicative of what we really think about Chief Rowe, Kurt Ivey, and many of you, because many of you have been here a long time. And I want to say thank you to all of you that I know have been here 20 plus years and still helping and still making a difference. So I ask the council this evening to consider all of that and consider how far we've come and how far we still got to go, but I'll tell you when I, when I reflect back on where we've been, we are blessed, we are a blessed city. And when I look at the destruction in Biloxi and other places on the Gulf Coast, I just say, I hope that those folks stay the course and have the same vision that many of us had many, many years ago, that you can make a difference and things will get better if you stay the course. So I'm glad Mr. Laws to pull this from the agenda because I think the public need to know that, you know, we're, we're soon to lose the, the chief and the manager there on their waning days, the waning years in Homestead. And um, I just think the contract kind of cement what we think of them. And I want to publicly say, job well done, keep up the good work. We still got a lot to do. Thank you all very much. Any other comments? Oh, Mayor. Mr. Lawson. If I might, and you know, we had some discussion and I had some concerns about not about the performance of the chief or the manager. My comments at our committee of the whole meeting last week were aimed towards certain provisions uh, that I had concerns about. And I learned last week that there seemed to be a uh, maybe an intentional campaign of misinformation as to what my position as to Mr. Ivey and, and Chief Roll are. And so as to not get off track and, and get caught off, caught in the moment and off guard, if I might, I have a, uh, a statement that I'd like to read from to, to clarify and, and put it out there for everybody who's here tonight in support of these two men as to where I was coming from. Mayor, fellow, fellow council members, Mr. Ivey, Chief Roll, and all of you here tonight in support of 
Manager Ivey and Chief Roll. Last week when we first discussed the contracts for the manager and the chief, I thought I had made it very clear that my objections were to certain provisions of the proposed contracts and certainly not personal toward either of these men who have dedicated many years of service to this community in many different capacities. It has come to my attention since we last met and is evidenced tonight by the many of you here in the audience to support the adoption of these employment contracts that my position has been misrepresented as one of being ready to fire one or both of them. I state now that I fully support and applaud the records of both Kurt and the Chief and by virtue of their record of, of uh, loyal service here they deserve contracts and insulation from the uncertainty of political change. I also recognize clearly that stability among the management team is in the best interest of the community even in the face of potential political upheaval. The approval of contracts for these fine men can and will provide an appropriate level of political insulation and management stability for our community. However, having said all of that, as an elected official who still considers himself a political outsider, in my view the provisions of the proposed contracts go far beyond merely providing stability and in my view serve to deny in effect a future council from exercising its absolute discretion to bring in a new management team. It is important to note that the council has the power only to hire and remove the manager as the chief of police serves at the will and pleasure of the city manager. Specifically my concern is that the documents before us provide that if in the event, uh, I'm going to address the manager, but the provisions are the same for both the managers, the contract and the chiefs, that if in the event the manager is terminated prior to the expiration of the contract, he will receive the greater of either the balance of the contract or six months severance pay. Currently the manager enjoys a three month grace period following any election from being removed and a six month severance provision in pay is already provided for under current agreements. That six month termination equates to nearly $65,000 at the manager's current salary level if in the event he is terminated in the council's discretion. It is my position that under these contracts that the, the, the grace periods plus the six months currently granted is sufficient. I believe that any more than that is against good public policy and is not a responsible action. While I fully understand the sentiment of many of my council colleagues that Kurt and the Chief have served this well and are entitled to job security, and I completely agree, they are entitled to security and stability and free from reactionary political intervention. I believe that what's before us now goes well beyond the balance between recognizing the contributions of these two leaders and trying to control the actions of our successors in office. Of the 22 municipalities in Miami-Dade County who have a management, manager form of government, none are known to have a severance provision of greater than one year. Six provide for no severance, one municipality provides for one month, three provide for three months, and six provide for the same six months that our, management, that our manager currently enjoys. And four of those 22 municipalities with a manager provide for one year. The proposed contracts before us also provide for short-term pay payout of all amounts due. I would like to see the severance pay portion period paid out over the remaining term of the contract so as not to create a burden on city finances in the event of that, uh, that action. Finally, I want to say to both Mr. Ivey and to the Chief that I do not anticipate that at any time I would be a proponent of ending your relationship with the city. And I reiterate my comments and concern that re reiterate that my comments and concerns are an attempt to balance the need for your employment stability 
and continuity of, of management with the right of future councils to act as they may see fit. While I sometimes differ in opinion with each of you, that is inevitable, but certainly does not mean that I have any intention or any anticipation that I would lead or join any attempt to remove you from your position. I want to commend each of you on the level of loyalty and popularity that each of you enjoyed. And I want to further say to each of you who are here tonight under an understanding that my comments and concerns or anything more than business-like comments and concerns, I hope that I've made my position clear that my concerns are as to contract provisions, not to the longevity or the performance of either of these men who have both had the opportunity to move on and certainly in, in times of thick and thin, the motivation to move on. I hope that whoever enticed you to be here tonight under the guise that Wassner was against either one of them needs to hear from you tonight. And I hope that you've listened carefully to my carefully chosen words. It's again my request that these contracts be amended to decrease the termination pay periods to not more than the equivalent of one year salary and to provide that the period over which those amounts would be paid would be the... Uh, the time for which they were they were granted, whether rather than than as provided in the contracts. And, uh, thank you all for the opportunity to to clarify my position. And if you were here under under misinformation, I'm sorry, and I wish you had called me. Um, it's a very simple matter. Um, you may not always agree with me, but I'm not going to hide where I'm coming from. And uh, I wanted to make very clear in light of the. Uh, the stuff that I've heard since Friday night, uh, I want to be very clear as to, to, to the foundation of my concerns. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Lawson. Uh, Vice Mayor. Thank you. When I walked in the room, I said, wow, what's going on tonight? I had, I had no idea, and I said to our city manager, I said, what's going on tonight? I had no clue. Um, when we discussed this at the Committee of the Whole, it was purely policy. That's all we were talking about was a policy decision. It, I, I am shocked that it obviously became personal because it wasn't. Um, in fact, the performance of the city manager was praised as being excellent, and Chief Rolls' um, vote, I believe, was unanimous. I don't believe there was any objections whatsoever. Um, my problem was not in the performance. The performance is fabulous. That's not the problem. The problem is... We're policymakers. We sit up here as policymakers. It's, well, it's not a popularity contest being up here. We're policymakers. And when somebody brings a provision to us, we look at it, we, we analyze it, and I say, wow, there was a six-month provision in the city manager's package, if you will, that would amount to about sixty-five dollars or $70,000 in case there was a termination. Plus, there's a real built-in protection for about the first year after any election, which is a three-month plus a six-month. So it's about a first-year safety cushion, if you will, that protects the city manager, and rightly so, and, and rightly so. And I agree that um, there should be a certain level of protection where somebody is able to do their job without fear of retribution, without fear of having to count, you know, votes every day, having to count the four, you know, and I understand that. In fact, I, I even told Kurt that my objection was not the performance, was not the only, the only provision in the entire contract I had a hard time with was a $400,000 severance package. And that's basically what it amounts to be. And I think that that is not responsible spending of the city's, of the city's money. And that was my only concern, because if you add up the salary times three years, it's about $400,000. And it just concerned me that that is not responsible city. That is not, as a, as a policymaker, that would be not responsible for me. And my only concern was in that type of a package for a city manager's position, as well as kind of um, knocking any future council off of the, the uh, ability to make any future decisions themselves. And that, that was my concern. So please, this is not personal. I, I don't know when it did become personal. I'm afraid there might have been a real disinformation campaign um, because, in fact, when I voiced my concerns on, and the only concern I did voice 
quite honestly, was on the city manager's severance package, but I'm, uh, because he does directly answer to the council, so that was my only concern. I really didn't voice any concern on, on the chief of police. It was just strictly on the city manager because he does answer to council. But please, please hear me out. This is not personal. Um, I'm very proud of our city manager, and, and I said it, said it at the committee of the whole last week. Kurt Ivey is very well respected <laughs> in Tallahassee in Washington, D.C., in the city of Homestead, and I'm very proud to call Kurt Ivey my city manager. Chief Roll is the best. He's the best. And I don't even have to tell you that because we've had situations just this last couple of weeks where I've depended very much on our police department, and they have been fabulous, absolutely um, fabulous. And that's the way they are to the whole community. So believe you me, it's not personal. Please don't take it that way. Um, if you ever have any concerns in the future or you need clarification, pick up the phone and call me. I really would be happy to you know, discuss this with you. Again, not personal. My only concern, again, is that we're granting a provision of that basically almost amounts to a $400,000 severance package. I don't think that's responsible for a city. It's strictly a policy decision. That's it. That's all it is. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Any other comments? Mr. Porter? Um, and then Ms. Ms. Garner. One of, the, one of the advantages, I think, that, that you have, Mayor, and maybe that I have is being served through the rough times when we couldn't keep a city manager. And the stability of the city suffered greatly by that. Uh, you know, Mr. Ivey was the last man standing uh, a few years back when the city was in the crunch. Absolutely. And and that instability was devastating. And it propelled us into a financial crisis. We were headed there, but certainly the instability did not help us at all. My position with these contracts is for the health and well-being of the city is to stabilize the government, stabilize the police department, and give a, a a sign that these men not only we're committing back to these men but they are also committing back to this community in the form of signing this piece of paper as well as we sign this piece of paper giving them uh, that 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 stability to feel comfortable in their decisions and you as as the the community and you as the employees the stability to understand that they're not on a slippery slope and that is really the key to me and I and I applaud the mayor for his vision in taking this to the to the next level and bringing something for the council to to debate and and to look at and and obviously from a public perspective I think that the the community needs to know that this is this is not just good for the two individuals it is good for this community the the possibility of a payout there's always a possibility of a payout if you had a manager that had no proven success or if you had a chief that had no proven success but I think that you can look at these two individuals and look at their success stories and their their firm roots in this community their, their absolute total of their understanding of, our, of the dynamics that, that we face you know so that being said I think it's in the best interest of this community to encourage these men to stay here and not let that the expertise and the knowledge and, and the, the pain and the suffering that you've gone through to, to get away from this community. So, you know, Mayor, I, I agree everyone has an opinion about what is and isn't supposed to happen. My position is I think that the timing is right. I think the two men that, that, that you have on the table tonight for discussion have far exceeded my expectations of, of what, we're, what we're needing for the next two, three, four years, and especially in my position with the police department. The chief is a stabilizing force. He knows the employees. He, he has a, an even-handed way of controlling everyone. And, and, I, and, Chief, I don't want you to go anyplace. I want you to stay. And I appreciate your recommitment back to the city in the form of a contract and agreeing to the contract, agreeing to the four years. And we said in the in the the committee of the whole that you know the manager we had really nothing to offer him when he was tagged with the job except headaches and heartaches. And we've been able to come back from an area where none of us are proud of to an area where we are today in in record time. 
I think that the, the plan that was laid out never anticipated us getting this far this fast. So, uh, Mayor, I, I fully support your initiative, and uh, I, I do think that these contracts are good for these individuals. This is not a cookie-cutter contract that we're going to apply to any city manager, or any chief of police. These are contracts for these two individuals because I think that it's good for the city, and I believe that they've earned that. So, that being said, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, uh, Ms. Goddard. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Porter. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Porter hit it on the, the nail on the head. Uh, we know these gentlemen. They have a proven track record. I don't see either one of them going anywhere during the contract period, but it gives them peace of mind to know that we're here for them and they're here for us. And I agree with you, Mayor. I think this is great, and I don't see any reason why you shouldn't give back to them what they've given to us. Ms. Wellman? Yes, um, thank you, Mayor. Um, I just had a vision of four years ago when we couldn't afford to give the cost of living raises and Kurt Ivey endured, I don't, I don't know how you did it. I would, have been, I would have been applying for another job and leaving. But he endured and he, and he rode the course and he stood strong and he stayed brave. And, and it, was, it was scary. It was really, really scary. But we didn't know how we were going to make the payroll for the employees for the entire city, you know, let alone raises at that time. So with that being said, um, I also feel confident that the language within the uh, agreements which really hasn't been talked about too much um, in Section 3, 3.2, is certainly adequate. So, thank you. Mr. Hall, do you come? Yes, sir, ma'am. Um, oftentimes, I, I, I talk about um, equality and, and, and fairness across the board. Um, however, um, we also experience, and, and no disrespect to our, our new player, because I, I do want to bring out the, the point of uh, Charles LePratt and his excellence and, and his wealth of knowledge that we had uh, before us. And because of, of not being able to um, act or, or not acting up, upon that, that uh, intelligence and, and that um, uh, all that he had to bring to us, uh, we ended up losing him to the county. And when he got an uh, offer from the county, uh, we then tried to counter offer, but it was kind of like too late and it was after the fact kind of thing. And for that reason, we, we lost a, a, a very valuable player on our team. And I think that this um, these contracts would... Give, give us that opportunity to, to maintain uh, our quarterback and our running back um, so that we can try for a championship a few more years. And, uh, and I, I, really do, I really do think that making that commitment would um, assist in, in, in giving them, again, as Mr. Porter said, the comfort level that they need to be able to to do their jobs and, and do a great job for us as they always have within the city and and maintain that relationship that they've, they've had with us. So I, I do also support um, your, your initiative and this contracts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank all of you for your comments. They were, from where I sit, they all well received and they're very good points. Um, let me make some final brief remarks and then we'll, we'll vote and we have a motion on the floor too and we'll get to that but in this contract there's protection for the people of homestead if the chief or the manager fail to perform their duties they can be terminated and there's no severance if if they are terminated because of conduct unbecoming of a public official and there are some state statutes that identify and define what unbecoming of a public official. There's no severance. The city is protected. And from talking both with the chief and the manager, I don't, I don't foresee payout of severance because they have agreed that it will serve out their term. And they will do their job well. And they will conduct themselves in a manner that they all be proud and the chief have done it for 25, 26 years, and the manager have done it for 18 years, 16 years, 
10 as the chief of police and 6 as the city managers, I don't see them conducting themselves in a manner that we would see need to terminate the employment. So I think the contract fully provide protection for the taxpayers of City Homestead and they've agreed to serve out the remaining years here at the City Homestead. The chief, as I said earlier, is under the drop program and the manager said after three years he's going to retire and continue to live there on 20th Street, 20th to Northwest 20th Street. So I think the protections are here and that's the important thing. So I um, thank you all for your comments. Mr. Lozner had a motion on the floor for an amendment to the contract. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second it. Second. Vice Mayor had a question? Yeah, I, I think I must have missed something the first time. So you're saying that this is, this is, I didn't realize that at the time, you're saying this is your last three years? What if we don't want it to be your last three years? <laughs> well, uh, that, that could very well be. But uh, I think I'm reaching a, a, a time and uh, a lot of energy here. Uh, Three years should take us for some projects that we have, and then we consider after that. But uh, I, I must have missed that the first time with the chief and the mayor, mm -hmm. I mean city manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It, is, let, let me get a second to the motion. We can vote on it. Second by the vice mayor. I just to extend it for one year. I just, no, it was the motion was to limit the severance so provision for one year. to the equivalent of one year. Right. Ms. Ms. Well, I just want to, I want to comment that um, the contract also says that, that at the end of three years, we do have the right to extend it a year. So, you know, I hate you'd have to make any kind of decisions at, the, at that point. Roll we'll call an amendment. Councilwoman Garner? No. Councilman Hodge? No. Councilman Lozner? Yes. Councilman Porter? No. Councilwoman Waldman? No. Vice Mayor Bell? Yes. Mayor Warren? No. Move Motion to, doesn't. I'll move second. approval of the manager's contract. Second, Mayor. Approval of the manager and the chief's contract, is that right? Want to do them together? Want to do them separate, separate them? Okay. Move approval on the manager's contract. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Okay. Moved by Mr. Porter, second by Ms. Garner. Okay. Roll call. Councilman Hodge? Yes. Councilman Mosney? No, but no reflection on the manager. Councilman Porter? Yes. Councilwoman Waldman? Yes. Vice Mayor Bell? No. Councilwoman Gardner? Yes. Mayor Warren? Yes. Motion carries. Move approval on the Chief's contract. Move second approval on the Chief contract by Councilman Porter, second by Councilwoman Garner. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Okay. Councilman Lozner? No. Councilman Porter? Yes. Councilwoman Waldman? Yes. Vice Mayor Bell? Yes. Councilwoman Garner? Yes. Councilman Hodge? Yes. Mayor Warren? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you all very much for coming. We appreciate it. You don't have to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Stay. Stay for the rest. But if they want to, let's give them a minute. <laughs> Did we move on the consent agenda? Need to oh, move. Yeah. Motion for approval on the consent agenda. I think that was moved by the vice mayor. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilman Hart. Any other discussion on the consent agenda? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Maybe I'll read this while they're leaving, right? Please be advised that the following items on the agenda are quasi-judicial in nature. If you wish to comment on any of these items, please indicate the item number you would like to address when the announcement regarding the quasi-judicial item is made. An opportunity for persons to speak on each item we made available after the applicant and staff have made their presentation on each item. All testimony, including public testimony and evidence, will be made under oath or affirmation. Additionally, each person who gives testimony may be subject to cross-examination. If you do not wish either to be cross-examined or sworn, your testimony will be given its due weight. The general public will not be permitted to cross-examine witnesses, but the public may request the counsel to ask questions of staff or witnesses on their behalf. The full agenda packet on each item is hereby entered into the record. 
persons representing organizations must first present evidence of their authority to speak for the organization. Further details of the quasi-judicial procedures may be obtained from the clerk. According to Section 2-591, any lobbyist must register before addressing the Council on any of the following items. At this time, the council, council members must disclose any ex parte communications concerning any items on the agenda. At this time, the clerk will swear on any persons who wish to testify on any, on any of the quasi-judicial items. Please rise and raise your right hand. I state your name. Hereby swear or affirm that the information I present shall be the truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you. Our first item is a resolution of the City of Homestead, Florida, granting a request by Prime Home Builders for a special exception to allow an entrance feature number one for the Crystal Lakes planned unit development. Located south of 312th Street, Campbell Drive, north of the C-103 Canal, west of Southwest 142nd Avenue, and east of Southwest 147th Avenue as legally described in Exhibit A and providing for an effective date. I'll move it. Second. Moved by the Vice Mayor, second by Councilman Hodge. Any questions? Well, this is a public hearing. Any comments from the audience? Yes, sir. To come to the podium and give us your name and address for the record. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished council members, <coughs> Mayor Warren and Vice Mayor Linda Bell, my name is Don Northcutt. I'm an old time farmer in this area. Uh, I moved out on the East Maori in the early 80s, and I have a problem that seems dim by all the grandeur that's been passed here tonight. <laughs> uh, but regardless, it's still very, very serious to uh, myself and, and Mr. Dawson. Uh, we purchased our property out there on the Maori knowing that road had been there probably since the Great Depression. It's a through highway and basically uh, it was a far rural road, a little bumpy in places, but it's been there and it served a great purpose to those of us who lived out there. We don't have to horse you out and go around to go to Homestead. We go out the back door and down the Maori and over on the Cayman and cross over to either one of the main roads and go into Homestead. Uh, the problem being is that what, for whatever reason, that road, 320th Street, is now four lanes up to 142 Avenue as far as the planning and zoning is concerned. And for whatever reason, right now, it's blocked off. That road no longer goes through. I have to drive out, drive around. My business suffers. Any of my walk-in trade or drive-in trade that might be there is no longer there. Uh, it's true that there's a, a process that normally is adhered to and owners of property that are affected by zoning have the right to go to a public hearing. Well, I assure you, I was never informed. I was never received any letter of it. The posting of that property by the city was down on 150 uh, Kingman Road. It was down on the other end of the property, and I have with me here Mr. Dawson, who owns the property with me and behind me, to confirm what I just told you. And what we feel is that it's counterproductive to bring a four-lane road up to a certain point and shut it off. Now, there's got to be a reason why our planning and zoning staff did this. We don't, we don't argue with any of the development that's going on. We don't have any problem with it, except we want our road to stay open. If they want to dig a canal or dig a lake and jog around it, we have no problem with that. We just, we just want our road to stay open. And I do want to tell you it causes me a hardship. I have to go out. It takes me an extra several miles, uh, maybe a little more than that, to horse you out and go around. 
And instead of going out the back way, I have to, if, it's, if it's in the morning, I have to duck through the traffic until uh, Campbell Drive is completed. And I tell you, it's severe over there in the morning, so I end up going all the way up to 288th Street to horse you around or go to uh, Lucy Street and go out that way. Depends which way north or south you're going. At any rate, we would ask this council member to find a way to keep that road open. Now, the road is there now. Let me, let me, um, it's no. going to be four-lane up to a certain point. Yes, sir. Let me ask, are you on the right item? Are you on item from A or D? Which one are you we're, concerned about? We're, I'm right beside Farm Share. I'm east to where the road closes, between there and 137th Avenue. Get my... Is but, he on the right item? No, Mr. Mayor, he's not. This is... But... I believe the, the road that he's talking about is the Bay Wings, uh, uh, Spine Road, thank you, Spine Road, which is going to again be a public access, privately built by the, uh, the developers. We uh, brought this through. I hate this, I think last October, and we agreed with most of it. We agreed that part of it would still remain a, the ability for a four lane to the east, eventually hooking up, continuing on to 137. We recently we met with the developers and with Mr. Porter's help, we got them to agree that they would be building the entire four lanes of this whole uh, roadway system. It does end at uh, the, the east end simply because we do not want to take it further on to the, I, I think probably by his piece of property, simply because that part of the roadway we feel needs to be improved. It's beyond the scope of this project, but it's set up so that when that roadway is extended all the way to 137, it will hook up with this and you'll have a, a passage all the way through. It will meander, there's no question about that. The desire is to make it meander, but the road will still go from point A to point B. I believe that's what he's talking about, sir. Could, is, is there any way you can meet with the staff and get a, because um, what, what I'm hearing is that there's a... Mayor Warren, it's my understanding there was some type of a resolution that was passed about eight years ago that, in, that had to do with this, and it has about two more years running. When it all boils down, the city, you and the members of this council have the ability to keep that road open. Now, I'm not sure of all the legal processes. Uh, it's the beyond problem, it. So the problem we have is not on the agenda. I believe you have the right to keep it open. M maybe so, but what I'm saying is it first got to be placed on the agenda for further discussion. And prior to that, I'd like for you to meet with the staff and see whether you can work it out. And if not, then you can come back to us and we'll talk about it. But it's not on the agenda this evening for, for discussion. No, Warren, I remind you, I stated that I was never informed, nor was Walter, about that road closing. I would have surely stood up and said something at that time. Now, I'm, I'm not here to cause trouble. All I want to do is keep moving. And we're trying, to, we're trying to get answers for you. You can find a way. I'm out of here. Could I ask Jay, you? Can, thank you. Can I just, can I just make mm -hmm. one quick comment? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Ms. North, I just experienced the same thing the other day. I, I came, I use that road a lot, and I came down that road, and I had to turn around and go back. So I know what you're talking about. And also, I do hope that you will meet with the staff. That's what they're saying. Meet with the staff, and let's try to work a compromise. And we need to get that road open because the seniors that pick up their commodities at Farm Share, they've been calling me. They, they, they use that road to go to Farm Shares to pick up their commodities each month. So it is important. They would use it from the city side. Yes. Now they have to go out and horse you around. Yeah. But they're not the only ones. I know, but I'm just saying yes, we're here to help you. That's we correct. Just need to, your first step is to meet with staff. Okay, and you should do that. Make an appointment with them, meet with staff, and then they'll address your problem, and then it'll be brought back to us on a council level. Thank you so much for the help. Mayor, let me just... Perhaps just let me see. Mr. President? Mike or Rick or someone, the, the fact that this road is closed is only a temporary basis. It's a function of construction, sir, yes. So the point is that although today you may be inconvenienced because there's a dead-end long range, 
as soon as we can, the intentions are to open that system so that you have full east-west connectivity. Yes, sir. The problem is a temporary problem. It is not going to be closed indefinitely. Temporarily, while we get the systems connected, while we get the improvements together so that it's a feasible road for everybody to use, absolutely it's got to be opened back up. So when you guys talk, let's talk temporary and let's talk timeline so that they can feel comfortable that we're not, we're not abandoning and giving up the access to the east and the west. Correct, sir. In fact, we're 100% honest with you and to reinforce what you and I spent a lot of time with the developer, we basically pushed, and I'll use that word, to get it continued all the way through and to allow it to be continued as opposed to the earlier version which it stopped internally. The biggest problem that we're going to have relative to your uh, request, and we will do it, is a time frame because we can give them some relative ideas, but we have to talk to the developers to see exactly what their time frames are. But you're correct, it is a temporary situation. It's a relatively long temporary situation, but it is temporary. But we can still discuss the availability of minimum improvements yes, to yes, safety sir. standards on what is now the yes, Maori, the unimproved portion of Maori. That could be something that the council could debate whether or not there is a position to minimally improve to a level of safety that we can allow yes, free-flowing traffic on what is now an unsafe road. Yes, sir. Okay. So let's just bring that back when, with, these, with these gentlemen. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. So what I'm hearing is just temporary. So it's temporary. It's going to open back up. All right. Let's get back to the agenda. Um, been a motion and a second, and I ask for public input. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? If not, I close the public hearing. Any final comments from council? Roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilman Porter? Yes. Councilwoman Waldman? Yes. Vice Mayor Bell? Yes. Councilwoman Garner? Yes. Councilman Hodge? Yes. Councilman Rosner? Yes. Mayor Warren? Yes. Motion carried. <coughs> Next is a resolution of the City of Homestead, Florida, granting a request by Pride Home Builders for a special exception to allow entrance feature number two for Crystal Lakes planned unit development. Located south of 312th Street, Campbell Drive, north of the C-103 Canal, west of southwest 142nd Avenue, and east of southwest 147th Avenue, as legally described in Exhibit A and providing for an effective date. Move Moved by the Vice Mayor, second by Councilman Hodge. Any comments from Council? This is a public hearing. Any comments from the audience? Any comments from the audience? If not, I'll close the public hearing. Any final comments from Council? Roll call, Madam Clerk. Yes. Councilwoman Waldman? Yes. Vice Mayor Bell? Yes. Councilwoman Garner? Yes. Councilman Hodge? Yes. Councilman Rosner? Yes. Councilman Porter? Yes. Mayor Warren? Yes. Motion carries. A resolution of the City of Homestead, Florida, granting a request by Pride Home Builders for a special exception to allow entrance feature number three for the Crystal Lakes planned unit development located south of 312th Street, Campbell Drive, north of the C-103 at Canal, west of Southwest 142nd Avenue, and east of Southwest 147th Avenue is legally described in Exhibit A and providing for an effective date. So moved. Second. Moved by the Vice Mayor, second by Councilman Hodge. Any comments from Council? This is a public hearing. Any comments from the audience? Any comments from the audience? If not, I'll close the public hearing. Any final comments from Council? Roll call, Madam Clerk. Yes. Vice Mayor Bell? Yes. Councilwoman Garner? Yes. Councilman Hodge? Yes. Councilman Lozner? Yes. Councilman Porter? Yes. Councilwoman Waldman? Yes. Mayor Warren? Yes. Motion carries. And the last item on the quasi-judicial agenda is a resolution of the City of Homestead, Florida, granting final plat approval for Carroll's Place, located south of the C-103 Canal, north of Southwest 320th Street, Mallory Drive, west of Southwest 152nd Avenue, Kingman Road, and east of Southwest 157th Avenue, Newton Road, as legally described in Exhibit A, known as Pod B within the Oasis Planned Unit Development, 252 multifamily units on approximately 14.48 acres of land, and providing for an effective date. Is there a motion for first reading? Move first reading. First reading by Mr. Porter, second by Mr. Hodge. <coughs> Any comments from Council? Yeah, Mayor, I think this is final. Final. This is approved on that first, right? It's final. It's final. final, final. final. Yes, it's final plan. Yes. yes I know because I voted against it the last time. <laughs> um, I look at this and I did a little math and we're getting about 17 and a half units to the acre, correct? Yes, ma'am. 
and I need to explain uh, for your benefit, everybody else, how that number comes about. I Can always you speak say, up a little bit, please. I need to explain how the number comes about. As I've mentioned in the past, in a PUD, you get the overall. And I realize every time we talk, we seem to be talking about the high one. But I need to, to show you a little drawing that I probably should have put in the packages. All these colored pieces, which is about 15 different pods, is part of the Oasis PUD, or Renaissance PUD, whatever it's called these days. It's basically 395 acres. It has 2,243 units, which translates into 5.67 units per acre. It does meet it. You are looking at one of the highest ones we've ever done. And I, I can't really tell you why at this point in time, except when you average the whole thing off, it does turn out to be less than six. Aesthetically, though, when you, when you cram 17, 18 units to the acre together, it is not, it's not pretty. And, and, unless I see some absolutely something fantastic, it's not. And this is the same. It's not your fault. It's just it's just the way it is. I'm it not is what it is, with you, we, yeah, right, It's not an argument. It's an observation. Um, it's the same thing that we've been discussing, or at least I've been discussing for almost two years. Where we keep averaging and doing this overall density, and it's not it's not aesthetically nice for the community. So I still can't support that. I thought we had we're correcting that in our code. We did correct part of that in the code. This again is something that was been in. In, the in process for a couple of years. Right. It, it really couldn't go back and try to, to adjust to that thing. Thank you. You're Appreciate welcome, that. Ma Thank you, Vice Mayor. Any other comments from Council before I open up the public hearing? Is this a public hearing? Any comments from the audience? John Burgess, 655 Southeast 30th. I'd just like to reiterate what the uh, Vice Mayor said. 17 units per acre. I understand the whole average out, gross, net, all that. But as a resident of that side of town, I just think that's an absurd number of units to be stuffed onto an acre of uh, and, and, and being developed over there. I mean, 10 or 11, we've lived with that. Everybody seems to be happy, but 17 seems to be a very, very large number that I don't think very many citizens on that side of town are happy about. Thank you, sir. Any other comments from the audience? I'll close the public hearing. Any one final comments from council? Mr. Porter? Um, this, is, this has been on the table a very, very long time. And now at the 11th hour, after we've gone through the entire process and it's the last pod, what's the ramifications to the city to change the rules? It, right. it, is, it is not the last pod, sir. There's a few more still that will be coming okay. in. But this seems to be the one that's got the biggest number on it. Well. A couple of the problems you really have at this point is that it's been approved a couple of times and based on that, this is basically built. So it's kind of hard at this point in time to go back and change this. This is in the ground, or actually out of the ground, because once you approve it at the t plant, et cetera, they go in to get permits with a whole harmless, which means obviously if you change your mind, you can tell them something. Get that whole harmless, they go out and build it. Now when they get basically done, they go through the final process, which verifies that everything that everybody has said along the way is legally exactly where it's supposed to be. They get that approved from the county, and then they actually close on the pieces of property as far as selling on those. So for this one, it's almost impossible to go back and change. As far as the overall is concerned, I may have to legal explain it a little bit further from what I may say is it really is not possible based on what they have. I believe the word might be vested at this point in time over this thing to go back and change this. It really is not, uh, I don't think, I don't think it can be done. You can ask Richard, ask Susan, maybe it can be, but since we've approved the overall master plan in the first place and then we approved everything along the way, it's kind of hard to go back and change it now at this point in time, I believe. Well, look, look. Susan, could you expand, please? Uh, Rick is correct. We made the decisions on the density at the level of the master plan when we first approved the PUD zoning for the overall 500-acre property. So that was the point at which that issue was before the council for decision. At this point, it's just carrying through and, and developing under those rights. So it's, so it's fall within the master plan that we approve. Yes. It also falls within the PUD ordinance that was on the table at the time and yes, the sir, and that was required. And even if you look at the current one that we have with the new version of six being whatever we would like to see as the overall, regardless of how we, how we get to as far as adjustment, this whole 395, almost 400 acres, turns out to be less than six per acre. 
Now, I realize we're looking at the most dense one, and everybody's going to be concerned about it. But when we looked at the ones that came in at 4.3 or something, nobody had a problem with it. Of course not. You can't average without having a high one to get the low one to match a six. Just so that everybody understands the length of this process and the fact that every, you know, we talk about rooftops over and over and over again, and it's the names of the pods change. And, you know, it's hard enough for us on the council to keep up with the the numbers because it was one name at so many units it becomes another name at so many units and then there is a follow-up name at so many units and you add up all the units it's still the same number yes sir because it's a confusing it's a confusing issue that that we're trying to keep track of and and you know that this thing has been on the table for a very very long time and yes sir and that was the, that's the issue and a lot of things that have been that were brought out in the PUD some have been some have been addressed in in, yes, in, a, in a cleaning up process so to speak but it's hard to go and clean up this over with the new rules if this is bad apply the new the new rule you can't it's it's hard to make them com, uh, comply to the to the new rule because they fall under the old rule in essence I'd say yes sir okay thank you clear Mr. Lawson. Thank you. I, clearly, I can't let this level of density go by without saying something. And again, both under the old rules and the new rules, again, I sat here and said, okay, I understand it's an averaging, but we need to have a cap within the cap. And whether it's 8, 10, or 12, we need to look at that. And I hope this is such an egregious example that at some point we can go back and revisit that. It may be too, I, clearly it's too late for this circumstance, but I think it points out the need of, of my concerns in the last code overhaul that there needs to be some other sub cap by pod. And I, I you know, I agree with the vice mayor that how do you, how do you make that blend with the other neighborhoods where you, you jump from four to 17? Aesthetically, I just don't think it works. But Rick, you said something that really is a separate issue and raises a red flag to me. Is that you said that after T Platt, that project begins to come out of the ground. Roads, drainage, and other infrastructure. T Platt and site plan, sir. T Platt and site plan, and these builder developers are out selling unbuilt, unapproved units as fast as they can. They indicated there's a whole harmless agreement. Yes, sir, it's all harmless. And not unapproved units in the sense that you have approved at that point in time what the T-plat is, which is how many units they are, how it's split up. You approve at the site plan what they look like, whether it turns out to be Mediterranean, whether it turns out to be uh, Key West or whatever, and then they do proceed. Now, the thing I need to point out, if you wanted to wait till final plat to do this, you would hold up all of construction for a good three, four years. And you would put a dead stop to it because the county cannot keep up with even just the final plat process when the things are really done to the piece of paper. So that is a, a very difficult disconnect to, 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 I think, to understand, but to really say I, I, I like okay. it. When, when was this T plat approved by us for this particular one? Do you have that at your fingertips? Just no, sir, but I say it probably a couple of years ago, at least a year and change ago. This was done before... Uh, we're checking that we think it might approval be approved. December 6, 2004. Grant preliminary plat approval. December 6. Could be. Okay, so that's within the body of the resolution. Pardon? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I'm just thinking out loud about the ultimate consumer. And let's, let's think about the the practical effect of that. We have to balance the, the stopping of all development with, let me be kind of facetious and say, what if two people on this council had fairy dust sprinkled on their head and the vice mayor and I had two more friends here who shared our philosophy on density and that this final plat was denied? Then we've got literally 252 buyers of units who have bought something that can't be built. And I see that as some major, major risk and a PR nightmare. I would have to say, sir, it, that it could happen. If that would happen, if it could happen, that's going to be a legal problem, yes, sir. Because right now, the way it's been set up, and I can only tell you again, 
this is the way it is. If you waited for the final plan to be able to do any building, it would not happen. Now, again, to – and I wish one of the builders was here to say this instead of me because I'm not making anything out of these projects. One of the things in, it, in their favor to some degree, even at 17.4, is every time we turn around, every one of these damn units is sold. So there has to be some reason that people would feel that – well, in this, that's a policy consideration as to, as to whether or not we want to build a unit for everybody who wants to come here. I understand that, sir. So and we do. we've gone through the density. We, we went through it before. Uh, the last time we went through it specifically, which is the current version, which is somewhat different as far as the ground rules of when this thing is done. We went through it a long period of time, and we had a vote here, and the vote ended up being essentially five to two, if I remember right. And I realize that if there's fairy dust and it becomes four to three, that's fine. It may happen. But if you're telling me there's a two-year time lag from T plat to final plat, that's another election away, and we we can't forecast that. And that final plat approval is isn't it in our sole and absolute discretion, or or are we really just a formality after the T plat's approved? It's fairly formal at that point. The only difference from T plat would be if the county has found anything where it's not in compliance with their standards. Usually, it's a, almost a ministerial act to approve the final plat. So probably legally and practically, once we approve a T plat. We're at the point of no return. Okay. For, for practical. And in reality, with a PUD, it's really the master plan and the creation of that zoning that determines the issues that you're concerned about. By the time you get to the site plan and T-plat, that density issue has already been determined. Right. And if I may, the Mayor and Council, briefly, um, uh, with the development of this scale, after it was be reviewed by the state um, and ADTs, which are average daily trips per day were calculated. It goes into concurrency formulas that are utilized for other developments and other traffic studies that have been proffered for developments that have come after. So it's definitely been incorporated into that aspect of, uh, of the process. The t plat approved from a year ago, those units are taken into account of unrelated and this future potting as well as everybody else's. The, the, the actual density level is, is what I'm speaking of it's, itself. Units per acre, which they look at the overall units, and it's kind of an older trend called cluster housing. I know it's a, a, a term everyone's familiar with. Um, doesn't really occur as often throughout the state of Florida as it, as it used to. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Laws. Any other discussion? Do we have, do we have a motion, right? I have a quick question. question. Uh, Vice Mayor Bell. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this basically brings us back to the zoning or a code change. So we have to go back to the drawing board, if you will, if we want to see improvements for the future and remove this. You know, if we're still working with the old, I know we're not working with the old overall density, we're working with the new overall density, but we never did cap it. So it looks like we need to come back and maybe re revisit that because that's been something that's been troubling me since the, since the beginning. And I don't like sitting here being a formality or telling me that I have to prove something that I'm very uncomfortable with because I still can't do it. But I think that we need to go back. Basically, I would advise us to, this council to go back and take another look at our code, take another look at our zoning, and we, it's very clear we need to work on one more item. Thank you. I just think that the point that Susan was making should be emphasized, which is the issues that you're really concerned about, which are density, are not really um, the, the point or the subject of the final plat approval. It's not the time. The time to deal with those issues is way, excuse me, way up front. This basically, the, the, the platting process is really a formality. Does it meet the specific requirements of the code for all these different areas? And if it does, then you must approve it. It's very, there's very little discretion in the platting process. Unfortunately, when, with the change of the council and the, pa you know, the passing of the time, this is when you really, you, you, when it appears that you're really approving this. But the truth is this was approved a long time ago and the, and the zoning change that you're talking about still wouldn't affect the plotting process. It would affect, you know, it would be, it would be implemented much, much earlier in the process to limit the size of the, to limit the density in each one of these pods if that's the way you decide, you decide to go. But the, it's a, the plotting process is not only frustrating for you, but it's frustrating for every single council where, where it's, where it's, where there's controversial issues because 
It is almost a ministerial act by the time you get it back from the county. It's not really discretionary. And the truth is, if we were to deny some of these, unless there was a specific thing where it did not meet up to the requirements, then we would be having a very difficult time defending it. But in other words, it appears to you and to the public as if this is a, you're approving this kind of density, whereas you're really not approving this. This density was approved years ago, and I know it's got to be very frustrating to have to vote on this stuff when it appears that you're approving the density, but it's really just a formality of approving it. But Richard, this can be corrected in code. I was referring to code more than I was referring to zoning. We can correct this in code. Yes, but you can't correct it in this. I understand that. I'm not saying that. In this particular point in the process, when you're getting a final plan back from the county, is not the time that that provision would be out. It would be a long time ago. I understand that. Because my objections were on record on the vote the last time we voted on that. But I just want to make this understood now that this is clear to me that we need to go back and revisit this for the future. I'm not talking about right this moment. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Yes. Councilman McGarner? Yes. Councilman Hodge? Yes. Councilman Mosner? No. Councilman Porter? Yes. Councilwoman Waldman? Yes. Vice Mayor Bell? No. Mayor Warren? Yes. Motion carries. Next item is a resolution of the City Council of the City of Homestead, Florida, finding that the acquisition of private property through negotiated conveyance or eminent domain serves a public purpose and is necessary for relocating, constructing a new city hall, authorizing the city attorney to initiate eminent domain proceedings, authorizing the city attorney to retain expert witnesses and consultants, and to take further actions that are reasonably required to acquire the private property described in Exhibit A, providing for an effective date. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by the Vice Mayor. Is there a second? Second, Mayor. Second by Councilman Porter. Any questions? Any comments from the audience? This is a resolution in regards to eminent domain. Any comments from the audience? If not, I'll close the public hearing. Any final comments from Council? Roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilman Hodge? Yes. Councilman Mosner? Yes. Councilman Porter? Yes. Councilwoman Waldman? Yes. Vice Mayor Bell? Yes. Councilwoman Garner? Yes. Mayor Warren? Yes. Motion carries. Second item is a public hearing, which is a resolution of the City Council of the City of Homestead, Florida, approving the assignment and transfer of control of cable television license from a subsidiary of Adelphia Communications Corporation to a subsidiary of Time Warner Cable, Inc., and then to a subsidiary of Comcast Corporation, subject to certain conditions, providing for conflicts, savings, severability, and an effective date. Public hearing. Is there a motion for approval? Is there a motion? Moved by the Vice Mayor, seconded by Councilman Hodge. Any comments? I'll open the public hearing. Any comments from the audience? Any comments from the audience? If not, I'll close the public hearing. Any final comments from Council? Roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilman Lozner? Yes. Councilman Porter? Yes. Councilwoman Waldman? Yes. Vice Mayor Bell? Yes. Councilwoman Garner? Yes. Councilman Hodge? Yes. Mayor Warren? Yes. Motion carries. Any public comments at this time? We made a little adjustment to the agenda. We will have public comments before business from the City Manager. Any public comments at this time? Public comments. Is that in just general for Walter Dawson? I own property on 142nd Avenue in Mallory. And, you know, a minute ago, I think you just voted yes for that 252 units. And, again, I want to remind you that Mallory is closed down. And at 252 units with usually two cars per household, that's 500 more cars going up and down Mallory, and it's blocked off. It's not finished. There's nothing done and no plans. That seems to be what the public's biggest problem with around town is nobody has four-laned anything. Nobody has done anything to the roads. And we're just creating so much clutter out here that, you know, we can't even get access to our properties anymore. And, you know, I've been out there over 25 years, and I just want to bring that point up. Thank you, sir. And that $7.6 million that the congressman shared with us today, that money will be used to four-lane roads in the city homestead. Absolutely. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
plus plus the impact fees that we, we, we're getting. Mari and what's the word? We're working on Mari. We're working on Mari. We'll be four laning. Um, and careful. Uh, three, 328 and 312. And improving Mari. So that's in the works. Thank you, sir, for your comments. Any other public comments? If not, business from the city manager. I have none tonight, uh, Mayor. Thank you. <coughs> Report of Mayor and Council, Councilman Lozner. Thank you, Mayor. Um, last time we were here, I spoke of the uh, upcoming 55th to 56th annual Rotary Dinner for the benefit of the Homestead Redland Girl Scout troops. And, uh, <coughs> I report that it was another rousing success and we served nearly a thousand people over in the pavilion at Harris Field for uh, a fundraiser for that uh, that event. So again, the, the community continues to turn out for you know, any number of, of events. Uh, a couple weeks ago I asked, uh, I guess, the manager and the clerk to check into why uh, or the ability of our ballots to be counted here that night. And I see that, uh, I guess, uh, Ms. Paul has uh, provided us with a response that uh, under no circumstances will the county be able to accommodate that request that uh, while other larger communities closer to, uh, to downtown get to have their ballots counted at their, uh, their city halls, we will again be forced to wait here till maybe 10 or 11 o'clock as we did two years ago for the results of our upcoming election. So. Uh, I hope that uh, over the next couple of years we can work to uh, to remedy that, but it seems to be that just uh, too little, too late. The resources just aren't there in the elections department. What? Uh, and we did offer to pay on top of that, but uh, I don't know. We'd be willing to, uh, under the mayor's signature, write a letter to uh, uh, County Manager George Burgess, see if we could get a uh, second opinion or third opinion, I guess. Yeah. In this case, if you would like to do that. What? Wouldn't hurt it. I don't have a problem with it. We'll do that. We can get it done. Let's get it. Yeah, the, 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 uh, the squeaky wheel. Yeah, keep trying. Keep asking enough people. You might find somebody to say yes. Yeah. Um. They need to I look forward to working with you for another couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, as, as I said the other night now, with the stability, I hope that we have the ability to really get in and do the final tightening up that, that we all know needs to be done to, to make this a far more efficient and uh, better running city. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Lozner. Our Councilman Porter. Uh, can, I know they put the, um, the, the stoplights at uh, 328 and 6th and Ave, the stop, you know, BJ's. I put the pole in. Can, can Mike, can you give us a kind of a guesstimation of what it would, when we'd start seeing some, uh, what's, what's the life expectancy of the, of the project now? How long will it be before we'll see a light up? Um, well, during the process, um, once they started a couple of weeks ago, the project itself uh, takes about a month to completion. So we're looking at about a, probably another two weeks or so before they complete. Uh, they're working on the electrical uh, conduit now and putting the control panels on the northwest corner. Uh, once they get that done, they'll be doing the wiring and and, uh, and the actual hanging of the of the street sign of the, tr the street lights. A couple of weeks. We're looking at a couple of weeks or so. Yeah. That's fantastic, fantastic. And last comment, I'd like to congratulate the manager and the chief on their on their contracts, and, and we do look forward to you guys continuing to do the good work that you've done in the past. That's all I have there. Thank you, Councilman Porter. Councilman Wallman. Yes, sir. I was writing myself a note. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, well, the parks report. The weather has really set us back. With all the rain and the rain and the rain, we have been postponed on a few projects. Um, but hopefully the weather will cooperate and we will be finishing the Strata Park, Audubon Park, before the end of October, we hope to have the walkway around the lake finished. We hope to have the pads down for the swings that I told you about, the passive swings that are going to be around the lake. And um, hopefully I'll have a lot more to report on parks next uh, at the next meeting. 
I wanted to mention the Chamber of Commerce retreat. Um, it was wonderful, and I want to congratulate Bob Farns. He's our new chairman for the Chamber of Commerce. Congratulations, Bob. Did a beautiful job. Very well attended. Very well attended. And I know the classroom that I was in, um, of course, fundraising. <laughs> I was in the fundraising course. Um, I think I could have taught that course, but uh, but it was good. Very, 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 very good, and I congratulate you on that. Um, good news for the city. On Sunday, October 30th, from 11 to 2 p.m., the Parks and Recs Department, um, we are hosting the Boo Bash at Harris Field Barn Pavilion for children 12 and under. Um, this is a trick-or-treating family event, and it costs $4 for the children and $3 for the adults. We'll have music, games, prizes, magic show, lunch. It's going to be a lot of fun. And if you want more information about it, just call our city and we'll direct you to our Parks and Recs Department. Also on that same day on Sunday, October 30th, from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m., we'll have our annual Trunk or Treat. And this is a safe place to bring your children to trick or treat. We'll have all her cars decorated and our trunks open. And last year and the year before, I mean, I, I didn't think it would get better than the year before, but last year, I mean, they, the city uh, departments just went all out to uh, decorate the cars and the trucks. And this is open to all ages, and it's free of charge. So I invite you all to come out. <coughs> Excuse me. The YMCA's third annual Halloween ball, which, um, thank goodness, I'm honorary chair this year, not chair for the last two years, is scheduled for Saturday, October 22nd at Keysgate Golf and Country Club. The, three, the theme there is Making Dreams Come True, and all the proceeds from the event will go directly to the children and the YMCA. So um, that's, that's near and dear to my heart. Um, as you all know, it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, October. And um, I urge you, you're going to hear it from me all through the month of October, please encourage your friends, yourself, your wife, your sisters, your daughters, anybody to go and get their mammogram. I'm sharing something else with you this time. Please, when you go to your doctor and ask for an, a, a, a prescription to get your mammogram, please ask him to, or her to write you a prescription for an ultrasound. Because breast cancer with early detection, you can detect it on an ultrasound. You can't always detect it on a mammogram. So that's just a little tidbit for you to know, and please hold it dear to your heart. I spoke to the manager's office earlier today, and um, we are, as of tonight, declaring Friday, October 14th, Breast Cancer Awareness Day for the City of Homestead. So I, I'm going to ask everybody to wear blue jeans that day, and of course I'm going to ask everybody to wear a pink shirt, but I know, I know I'm not going to get that out some of you guys, but <laughs> cheap. <laughs> I know you own one. <laughs> But anyway, um, October 14th, Breast Cancer Awareness Day for the City of Homestead. Wear your blue jeans. Let's, let's make, a, make a statement to remind people to get your mammogram. And my deepest sympathy goes out to the Beard family. I know Mr. Losner has a long relationship with um, the Beard family as well, but they've been our personal friends for over 34 years. And um, Judy Beard passed away her service her viewing is Friday night and her services are, are Saturday and also my sincerest regrets for the Dykes family and for those of you that know Eddie Glenn Eddie and I have known each other since we were little tiny kids and he suffered a very massive stroke over the weekend and he's in very grave condition so I ask for your prayers and, and um, I ask for you to put him on your church's prayer list and let's pray for a rec speedy recovery for Eddie and Holly and the boys so with that being said thank you Mayor and just to follow up on Ms. Warman we also had an incident at Harris Field where the young man collapsed yeah. Yeah. and I got an update today that he was in um, ICU at um, what hospital is that? Jackson. Jackson. At Jackson Memorial Hospital. So we say a little prayer for the young man and his family. Um, we hope he come out of it. I, I think he's in a coma right now. So thank you, Ms. Rollman. Vice Mayor Bell. Thank you, Mayor. I also wanted to um, 
compliment the chamber con the chamber conference it was it was very very it was a good conference the installation banquet was very very nice also um, we had an EFBD meeting last week and then the EFBD is and the, the first school starting is progressing very very nicely um, we have a panther mitigation issue because in 1984 you heard me right in 1984 a Florida panther was seen out in the area of where the school is going to be built we have now we now we now have a panther issue with the Florida Army Corps of Engineers so we are working on that so when you wonder why things kind of go slowly and sometimes grind to a halt it's because of the bureaucracy that we have to deal with so we are in the process of making some phone calls so but we are on target we're going to have a groundbreaking in 06 I mean in 05 but hopefully 05 but we will be delivering the, the school in 07 the beginning of 07 so it's we're not going to be that far off of target and we're actually looking at the school board with maybe doing a mid-year school opening which is something they don't normally do is a mid-year school opening so that was something that was mentioned also last week there was a lovely uh, check presentation ceremony to the waterstone charter school um, from pride homes uh, it was the crystal lake mitigation and it went very very well also i wanted to um Mention, I got this letter um, Councilman Lawson had brought up and supported along with Mr. Shahada, the returning of the Eagle from um, JGT Transportation, and I see that we have a letter, and I was just wondering and curious, um, being a, you know, a big historic buff myself, living in a historic home, if um, we have heard, gotten any response from JGT um, Transportation. Not as yet. I, I got that same uh memo uh, I guess yesterday or mm -hmm. and uh, what we're doing I'm, I'm talking with Rick to see if we can expedite the contact there Maybe okay successful contacting okay very good um, also um, I um, Councilwoman Walden does a very good job of, of sharing with you about breast cancer awareness month and being in October and that's it's excellent and there's something I I have never shared here before and I don't I don't choose to share it very often because it's very difficult, but in 1989 I lost my mother to breast cancer. So it's not anything a lot of people know about. So just please, please do, do your mammograms and do, do your yearly checkups and follow-ups. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Councilwoman Garner. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> First I'd like to remind everyone that this weekend is the Boy Scouts. Uh, 56 annual spaghetti dinner that's troop 69 and it'll be out at the scout hut on Plummer drive between kingman and newton it's always a good time hope to see you out there uh, also that evening is the agri council barbecue at harris field pavilion it's good food and i'm pleased to sponsor a proclamation for um jody johnson so i hope you come out and help us celebrate uh, mr attorney i was hoping you could help us with an issue mr chandra and i have been working on something at the the Waterstone. It seems they have newsstands right at the entrance and it's causing a traffic problem. It's a health safety issue because people are stopping and getting out. And grabbing the newspapers right in the middle of the intersection. Now, I'm not sure if it's in the city right of way or in the homeowners association right of way, but if it's in our right of way, we can tell them to move. If it's in the homeowners, I'm not sure what we can do. I know that that's not in our jurisdiction if it's in the homeowners association, but it is a safety issue, and I would like us to to help them out because I've gotten a lot of complaints about it. Okay, we'll follow up with staff on that and see what we can do. Um, it's a and a lot of times it's a code enforcement issue as to where they if it's in the city right of way. Right. But we will follow up and and we'll uh, and we'll let you know what we can do there after we uh, take a look at what the location is. Okay, but they also told me that if it is in the in the city and they just move it a little bit, that it wouldn't be a problem. But I'm I'm thinking that it still would be a problem. So if you could look into that as well, we'd be glad to. Great, thank you. And lastly, I would just like to address some of the comments made. As the chairperson of the Code Revision Committee, we've worked very hard on our PUD code. It was actually created from scratch. We didn't have a PUD code. We started that new. The staff did a lot of work on that. We've had some great improvements. There's quality of life issues that include you know, open space, um, usage of water as a lake. For instance, previously you could use a lake as complete open space. Now if you're going to use it as open space, it has to have you know, minimal has to have a walk path, then you can use it as 10%. Uh, if you add boat access, beach access, fishing and all of that, then you can actually count it as open space because if it's just a lake, 
it's not helping you. So those are some of the things that we did. But the purpose of a PUD, or plan unit development, is to provide options. It's a mixed use. It has low density, it has mid density, but it has to be capped at a maximum of six units per acre. It, it includes commercial, and it includes options such as condos and townhomes. Now I live in, a, I live in Centergate, I live in a, in a condo. Those are high density, but I do not find them unsightly, and that's what I can afford. So we need to provide opportunities for our residents. And if we cap these pods, it's possible that the PUD will not work overall. In fact, I've talked to the designers, and I don't think that some of them would work if we cap them. Now, I do agree that 17 units per acre is high. I'm going to talk to the urban designers and see what we can do, but capping it at 6 units per acre per pod would never work. Well, we weren't asking for 6. Well, what we, I, I think what we should do is have our designer come, have our planners sit down, and see what we can do to discuss this. But I just want you all to understand what we're trying to do here. We're trying to provide options for everyone. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Garner. Um, Councilman Hodge. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think the uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, conference has pretty much been covered. But while I was there, uh, they uh, got my arm and twisted behind my back. And, and gave me some work to do. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and being um, Chair of Economic Development, uh, I, I assume position and uh, will do the work that they've, they've put me out to do, and that is to um, uh, encourage our local businesses in the area uh, to become members, and, and not just members, but active members in our, in our local Chamber of Commerce. So that's going to be my, my, my dance and my song for, for, for as long as I'm, I'm here and, and try and build a closer working relationship with them and, and get more, well, we come together and get more involved with each other and, and try and, and boost our Chamber of Commerce up because it's, it's a great wealth of information and knowledge that is there and a lot of opportunity there for our local businesses to come in and work together. And I do want to... Um, Thank them for all the hard work that they put in, in this weekend, and, and I enjoyed it. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Hodge. And just a couple of brief comments. The gentleman here talked briefly about uh, transportation, and I know we're coming up with the master plan, but in response to the um, $7.6 million, I'm, I'm hoping that the city will send something out and explain to the community the purpose of the 7.6 and what we're going to do in terms of road improvement. We just need to get it out. Just let them know as we grow and develop that the roads are coming, the roads in the works. And um, the congressman, and I, I can't say enough, as we talked earlier about the, um, the effort of our congressional delegation in Washington, D.C. just done a fantastic job for us. And, but let's let the community know with that $7.6 million and the impact fees that we're going to do some major um, road improvement in the city homestead. So let, let's get that out as best we can. On Friday last week, the manager and I had an opportunity to go out to Ford International University. And I was privileged to sit on a panel with the mayor of um, Sweetwater and the mayor of North Miami. And we've talked about really... FIU expanding in other areas, and Homestead is a target. Um, and I think there's a meeting already scheduled with representative from FIU to be coming down, Vice Mayor, to talk to us further about um, their presence in Homestead at some point. Um, it was a very good discussion with the faculty and Provost Rose, Dr. Rosenberg, and that whole team there. I think they're enthused about coming to Homestead. I think we're on the right track, and uh, I'm hoping in the months ahead, uh, Vice Mayor, with uh, your leadership with the school, that we're able to make, able to make it happen. I, and I'm going to officially turn that over to you and let you deal with it. But when they come, I'll, I'll, I'll be there to, um, to go on the tour with them in Homestead. But it was a very good meeting, and uh, the faculty is very, very enthused about um, coming south, and I think it's very, very important. Um, let me also... Um, Thank the Chamber of Commerce. I was, I was there also, and um, the workshops were very well, uh, were very well done. I think the um, facilitator did a very good job, and I'm hoping to see some real good things come out of our local um, Chamber of Commerce. And that's all I have. 
I want to thank you. Mr. Mayor, can I just two quick? First of all, Ms. Garner, I wanted to let you know that we had done some work on the mailbox issue. I'd like to try to get back to you quickly on these things. The newsstands? The newsstands. And apparently it is newsstands. You're earning your money tonight, Richard. Yeah. It's, they are in the, they are not in the public right of way. They're on private property. And so we'll explore a little bit more as to what we can do. But it probably is something that's going to fall within the purview of the Homeowners Association. But David did work with Rick on it a little bit. And so I'll get back to you on that. Anything that we can do. I just wanted to announce two things, sort of nice things. I know none of you get the Florida Bar Journal. But there is a, a one of, well, one of you does. There is a very prominent article there by Susan and Chad Friedman of our office on the impact of the new growth management legislation, which is a very, it's not easy to get published there. And Susan's recognized around the state as an expert. And then Susan was also part of a team that was hired by the state of Florida Department of Community Affairs to advise them on educational concurrency issues. And that is also quite a feather in her cap to, and to our land use team to be hired on something like that. So I love to announce kind of things like that. Could we get a copy of the article? The article, we'll be glad to sound printed with thousands. I would love to read it. Richard, now you know why I have Susan attend all the EFBD meetings. I was wondering why you don't invite me. I don't want you, I want Susan. I got it. Mayor. Yes, sir. Also, Richard, I got a seminar notice, and I think half of your firm's going to be out one day in the next month or so putting on a land use seminar that I won't be able to attend. But I tell you, if any of you can take off and go, I mean, I don't know who's going to be minding the store that day, but it's a stellar cast of presenters for an all day. So we'll continue the legal education seminar, but it may be of some benefit if you can attend. When is that, Susan? I believe it's November 4th. Yeah, it's a it's Friday. A Friday. Day. When all the really good people are out speaking, they've not left <laughs> back in the office answering the questions. <laughs> Don't call that day. That's why your name's first on the letter day. Well, I want to thank each and every one of you for coming out this evening. It was a very um, good meeting, and I appreciate it. Chief, Chief Holt. Yes, uh, Mayor. I just wanted to uh, publicly thank the mayor and uh, the council member that, that believed in me and supported the contract. Uh, 26 years is a long time. I I don't know when it, when it ends that you have to basically have people believe in you. But uh, again, I want to thank you all and, and also uh, Councilman Porter being chair of the Public Safety uh, for believing me as well. Uh, you know, we're not going anywhere. I could have left a long time ago. I definitely could have left this year. I chose not to do that. And uh, I just wanted to let you all know that you know we we uh, we are dedicated. And we've been here a long time, and uh, it hasn't been easy. Uh, you know, I didn't come in from Miami Beach or Carl Davis to come police chief. I started on the street, out of the streets of Homestead, and I worked my way through the ranks to earn the position. I, I think I represented the city well, and uh, I really, you know, really appreciate that uh, the contract and that you all believe in me. So, thank you. I really appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. And uh, I'm going to be here, and I'm going to do what I got to do, and I'm going to uh, live through the contract that was given to me tonight. I just want you all to know that, and, and thank you very much. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Have a good evening.